Yeah, and we are so blessed to have people from literally all over. There's some that sent apologies, couldn't make it. Some of the sages, as we call them, Costa and Alexander, who, by the way, needs our prayers right now. He's in some ill health in, in New Zealand. I'm not exactly sure of the final uh, description of that, but we could be praying for him as well, please. And uh, Derek Morphew, and these guys are scattered globally. They're always all over the place. So they um, would love to have been with us tonight. Um, we're also looking forward to the lineup of people that will be sharing over this time, so that's going to be a, a great experience to just to have these uh, guys come and share. Um, so if you've got your Bibles here, guys, you still read the Bible? The one, the NIV one, the Nisarian Vineyard one? You got that one? Good. Pull it out. Let's get to a, a scripture in Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, hey? Plans for your welfare, not for calamity, that you might have a future and a hope, eh? Plans to, to bless you, a future, a hope and a future. And uh, I just want to say that I, I was blessed with the idea that God's kingdom, his, the kingdom of God, is his dream for mankind, how he wants us to be. And the purpose of the church is to serve the kingdom. The kingdom is a critical corrective. We get all our direction, all our values, all our emphases, our priorities, all from the kingdom. How we understand the kingdom is absolutely vital. Uh, Napoleon, Napoleon, I was recently doing a, I love history, I was recently reading about him and one of his great statements was, "In imagination rules the world. And I think the Lord wants to awaken our imagination, awaken our, our sense of capacity to dream. And that's what he did on, on Pentecost, you know, old men will dream dreams, said Joel, hey? Joel too. And your young men will, will have visions and there'll be this, this sense of imagination awakening by the Spirit of God just leading us forward. And... Uh, and there'll be a fresh discovery of who we actually are and who God has called us to be. And that's what's going to happen for us over this week. We're going to find out all over again who we actually are. Whenever I say that, I think of that airline pilot, I'm told, who uh, realized they were in engine trouble and the thing was going down. Uh, you guys don't want to hear about this. You've just been flying to come here. <laughs> but anyway, and uh, he said, uh, we've got problems. We have to lighten the load. We've decided, don't panic. We've got it. We're going we're to lighten the load, uh, asking people to leave by alphabet. <laughs> so we'll ask all the Americans and the Africans to leave first. So then uh, they still need to lighten the plan some more. So a few minutes later, he says, we need to ask a few more to leave. We're going to ask all the Brits and the blacks to leave. Anyway, uh, they needed a light and played some more, so they said, we're going to ask the Canadians and the coloreds to leave. So a little boy turns to his dad and said, Dad, who, what are we? He says, today, we are Zulus. <laughs> 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 so we, we choose our identity by what uh, suits us, eh? Anyway, may the Lord help us and give us mercy. <sighs> One of the things that we learned from Bill Hubbles, you can you remember them, they, all the global leadership summits and things we've had over those years, and Bill, Bill Hubbles used to always teach us about uh, the value of discontent as a prelude to vision. You cannot really, with passion and resilience, embrace vision until you know why you, you need to move on from where you are. So you need to be discontented. So don't get dis discouraged when there's discontent coming your way or crossing your leadership uh, agenda. These are necessary discussions if you are preparing for a, a new season. And I was just thinking about our own history as a, as a vineyard movement. I'd like to just take a, a few minutes to recap a couple of things that would help us and then, and then land on, on some things from a, a biblical point of view that would probably require us to get some more solid thinking. But how many of you, and I know Yorkers here and a couple of others that were here that from, from, can remember the, the, the vineyard in the 80s, eh? Uh, we, we all know the story of John Wimber from uh, being a fool for Christ, whose fool are you? Remember that whole thing? And, uh, but when the vineyard landed in, in Africa in, in the 80s, early 80s, um, with those big outreaches in Johannesburg, and uh, what a wonderful time that was of seeding over those uh, 10, 15 years of Wimber coming out from 82 through to 96, eh? I think it was 96, 97, he passed in 97. Uh, years of seeding, just sowing uh, seeds. Much like Brian is doing. Hey, Brian, appreciate what you're doing in our, in our nation. Coming this team year after year and just seeding in a uh, fresh expectation for the miraculous, eh? for the intervention of God and <clears throat> signs and wonders of the kingdom. 
And Wimber was, he, he introduced a season of seeding, uh, a new vision for the church that, that captured our, our, our willingness to move on from where we were. We had been caught with discontent, many of us in, in our situations. <clears throat> and then we had Costa and Lorraine stepping in and, and giving leadership to the movement over a chunk of time as well, 20 some years, and helping to bring development to what was seeded. And, and gave structure and, and facilitated a number of things in place. I remember those very early parts of that back, actually, some of them started also in the 80s, back in Betty's Bay. Uh, if John Fisher was here, he'd remind us of Hans Bay, Stray Spy, some of those places where we used to gather and uh, we used to drive from all over the country just to meet and say, how can we serve the kingdom? And so there was a, a gathering of us, and, and then in that time, there was slowly a developing. Uh, capacity that grew with us. And then just about five years ago, Colleen and I were asked to take a leadership, and we feel like our role has been especially around consolidating and expanding. And we've taken the first five years, it was going to only be five, but we uh, were asked uh, with consultation of the leaders just to extend it a little because of the whole COVID interruption, all that, that brought that uh, onto our plate and uh, managing all of that. But certainly has been a, a, a wonderful time of pruning, of set, settling some things, consolidating, and, uh, and now being ready for some serious expansion. I think God's calling the vineyard to be far more expensive than we have been. The time has come. Uh, we've, we've set aside the things that we've grappled with. Uh, we've grappled long and hard. There's been pruning. There's been adjustment. There's been some crucial conversations, truth and reconciliation levels of conversations. And, uh, and, and I praise God for and thank you, those who've been involved with many of us, as we've grappled with the things that need to be cleaned up for us. Um, and in this time, we've, the movement has moved from being, uh, some of you will remember, uh, in those early years, a set of four provinces, um, and I must say, it's great to have people here from all these areas of, of, of South Africa uh, at this event. But from four, from four provinces or regions, we grew it up into 11. So now we have an expanded leadership team uh, from approximately a dozen people to about 38 people involved in a broad leadership, just as you can understand how the thing hangs together, which includes uh, a whole set of uh, Focus areas, not only regional leaders, but focus areas, and we've seen glimpses of those in some of the, the talks that have been given and some of the, the videos. And as we, we move forward in this time, we talked about just to, to bring things into perspective for those who haven't been part of all the leadership, we talked about if we were going to move at all, we'd have to be willing to commit to three Gs. Uh, we'd have to be commit to, to going, growing, and giving. And we made that just our, our bottom line launch into this season five years ago. And as a result of that, we also realized we needed to be more sure that we were defining what it meant as a core vineyard church um, in very practical and, and uh, ways of integrity. And we call that the, the three Fs. <laughs> Excuse me, guys. We just <laughs> the, 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 the need for fellowship. We, if you're not fellowshiping with other vineyard leaders, then there was something deficient in your vineyard experience. And the, the need for the flavor of the vineyard, namely the genetic code, the DNA, all the core values. And by the way, if you want to ever read about them, they're in that back corner on the wall. There's a list of the vineyard genetic code. So the flavor was there. And also finances. And uh, old Steve, who couldn't be with us now, Steve uh, Ulefi, who's over attending a conference in the, U in the U.S., he always says, you can't, uh, if, you, if you follow the money, you'll find the heart. So there's a need for us to have our finance uh, flow along the same direction as our convictions. Uh, otherwise, we schizophrenic. <clears throat> so core vineyard consists of those things. And then we hit the COVID years, eh? And the COVID years uh, challenged us. Uh, and we, many of us that have, have come through that time, um, Surviving all the pulls and the pushes from all the sides that were going on uh, on this thing, including uh, something of an anti-corporate church move that began to happen. But many of us are stuck to the value of the scriptural view of don't give up meeting together. And that's at every level. So those that have done that, we've observed, have actually done better than those that took a timid approach and, and disbanded the corporate also been through seasons uh, of, of moral lapses and falls that have been challenging for us uh, as a, right across the nation. And uh, um, 
But it's been, a, it's been a time of pruning and preparation, and that's why I say we've now reached the place, and I'm so grateful for uh, Vilna and the prophetic people that constantly encourage us. You guys are amazing, and it stir us up to listen to the Lord and go forward in what He's telling us. Um, and we have seen more churches starting to contribute significantly. We've always had about, there's been about 60 some churches in the Vineyard Network in South Africa, um, and that I mean across the board, uh, besides other friends of the Vineyard, that includes plants and so on. But um, about 16 of those were, were faithful in contributing financially, if that's an indication of heart. Then uh, that has moved up to about 27 consistently giving churches now. So that's, uh, that's an encouraging thing for us. There's something shifting forward and a greater willingness to embrace. And as I said, too, uh, there have been some strong conversations. And um, pubs, thanks for leading those conversations on what we call crucial conversations on particular issues and ethics and things. But um, there have been interpersonal conversations. that All of these have helped us to grow a little bigger a little bit more mature, a little bit more inclusive and expansive. Uh, and so we, I think we're poised for a, a new, new season, including, uh, including in that is, is fresh plants that have emerged. Um, the Stansbury is here. Why don't you guys stand up quick? David and Lindy, just stand up from New Wine Vineyard, right here in Lorraine. Give them a hand, guys. Good to have you guys with us this, morning, this evening, huh? Awesome, man. We appreciate you guys so much. Um, and... Uh, then, uh, why, uh, where is Impact Vineyard? You guys here? Peter, Peter and Gert, you guys here somewhere? There we go, right at the back. That's a new, brand new church that's come into the vineyard very recently. They've just uh, relaunched uh, just at the other end of this long street you're called the William Moffat, and that's called Impact Vineyard in process, because when churches are still being developed, we call them in process, so people understand it's a, it's a developmental thing, and uh, so that's happened right here as well. There have been others as well, up here, the, what's called the wine press vineyard, a baby, baby vineyard burst in Bloemfontein. Can you believe that, guys? Where's uh, Ravon and uh, Candice? Where are you guys? Ravon and Candice, you somewhere? Stand up there for a moment, just give them a hand. They're from Bloemfontein, guys. So we excited about that. There's also development happening in in in, uh, in George. Derek and Marion Flanagan are preparing to step back in April, and uh, Andrew and Taryn are moving in from Benoni. Are moving down to 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 George to pick that up, and they'll run tandem with their Benoni Worker Live Vineyard and George uh, for a season, and and they're raising up new leaders to take over Benoni in due course. Where are you guys, eh? Uh, Taryn, here we go, right at the back. Well, give them a hand as well, guys. Bless you, man. We're going we're gonna to take some more time to pray over you guys uh, as the thing goes on. And then there's just one other very important development also down here in the Southern, uh, Southern Cape with um, Christ, a church called Christ Kerk. You've got to be off the corner to say it properly, eh? Christ Kerk. Um, where is uh, uh, Andrea, eh? And Alfred, why don't you guys stand? They, they're, gonna, they're moving over from Nasa to George to lead Kreiskerk now. So bless you guys too, eh? Awesome to have you on board. So things happening. Um, there's another, another vineyard being launched up in Mission Vale. I'm not sure if Timber's here tonight, but uh, also Lindy, eh? Is Timber here? Timber, why are you lying down there? We'd stand up. This is from uh, Timber from Mission Vale, leading a, a church. Uh, his church is in the homeland of Sia Khaleesi. Can you believe it? he comes from that area? Eh? Anyway, great timber. Nice that you can make it tonight. Um, and then um, Zwilitsche, there's a plant happening in Zwilitsche that's been quite some time. Was Zozo leading that? Eh? So I don't know if he's Zozo here. Where's Zozo? Zozo! Thank you, man. Bless you, man. Zwilitsche down in the uh, what we call the Sunshine Coast, just uh, outside East London what they call the Buffalo province, where they play that, uh, some of that is a home of South African rugby, I don't know if you know that, from Buff Buffalo province and dispatch, where it's where our rugby comes from, guys. Wasn't it a good game the other night, eh? eh? Oh, praise God. He's a... <laughs> anyway, we... I think we've called, we've turned a corner and it's time for us to think, pray, listen, and expect expensively. As a movement, and I want to talk into that a little bit tonight, as we as we do this. Uh, I think it's going to be a season where there'll be fresh joy, uh, fresh love, fresh levels of faith, uh, and it's a new day. Uh, 
you know, as they say, weeping may last the night, but joy comes in the morning. And to, uh, this is morning time. It's time for us to rise up and seize the day that God's given us. For too long, we've camped around our discontents and around the things that have kept us locked in levels of passivity, maybe from fear, maybe from addictions to past issues, whatever it might have been. But we're setting it behind us now and saying, Jesus, thank you that you're leading us into a whole new thing. Uh, there was a prophetic conference we can read about in the scripture. So get your Bibles out of 2, Corinthians chapter, 2 Kings chapter 4. I want to take you to a, a, a prophetic conference that happened. It, uh, it, there were others similar to this, but this was a special one by Elisha, the successor of Elijah. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38 through 41, just those couple of verses. Um, this is going to be a season. I think the Lord is going to speak to us through this. And I believe in this time, let me just say this, in this time of expansive living as, as a people, as a church, as a movement, I believe he's inviting us to exercise the kind of faith and visionary movement that would be attractive to divine investment. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Eh? But he's, he's so pleased with those who trust him. He's attracted to faith. He's attracted to our embracing of the getting out of the boat and walking on the dangers of the water and risking what that could bring about for us. So I want us to read this little passage, 2 Kings chapter, chapter 4. Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in that region, trouble in the land, and we know all about that. Eh? While the company of the prophets was meeting with him, he said to his servant, Put on the large pot and cook some stew for these men. So this is where we know Elisha was actually South African. He's making poiki. Okay. <laughs> One of them went out into the fields to gather herbs and found a wild vine. He gathered some of its gourds and filled the fold of his cloak. When he returned, he cut them up into the pot of stew, though no one knew what they were. The stew was poured out for the men, but as they began to eat it, they cried out, O man of God, there's death in the pot. And they could not eat it. Elisha said, get some flour. He put it into the pot and said, serve it to the people to eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. Isn't that a wonderful little story, eh? I think it's every caterer's dream. Eh? Just throw some flour in and it sorts it all out. Eh? Yeah. Well, uh, this is, this is a demonstration of faith because a, a few chapters earlier, Elisha had a similar thing and uh, there was bitter water, or toxic water, and he, and he told him to get a new bowl and put salt in it. But now he's calling it to a new thing. This time put flour in it and, and it changed the whole deal. Uh, you know, we, we, we like Elisha. It's, it's the call of ministry uh, and to find that thing that God is calling us to equip the people to be able to embrace uh, uh, edification and a new direction uh, and famine. It's, uh, we, you know, this week we celebrate our dams here in, in Kabecha. Uh, uh, amazing. It's between 70 and 100% or 105% full, our dams. I mean, we were, we were on like day zero. It was just looming not so long ago. And other parts of our nation have felt the same. So we feel like it is a new day. There's water in the land again. Amazing, hey? Um, so this pot represents uh, our fellowship together, the stew we, we would enjoy. And uh, it does speak of the, the, the willingness to have whistleblowers to say, hold on, there's death in the pot. And I know we don't always want to talk about that. We say, no, just cover it up. Let's hope they don't get too sick. Pop them some enos or something. And just, we can't cover the, those things need to be faced. And otherwise we'll never have, be able to enjoy this meal. And this is what he's saying. Um, this is a time that we might come because we've been all over the place. We've got all sorts of ideas. We've filled our, our gourds, as it were, with wild things, untested stuff. Stuff that's not gone through the filter of uh, either our theology, our values, doesn't comply necessarily with our, our genetic code. And, and we have been caught by the trap of uh, what is woke, eh? what is acceptable in the cultures in which we live. And, uh, and God is calling us to a fresh day, I believe, as far as these things are concerned. But here's the thing. If we're going to live at all meaningfully, we've got to know that God is a God of good news. And what he wants for us is to be well-fed, to be edified, to be built up, to be a people that, that are nourished and have, have purpose and hope and significance in their lives. And if the salt has lost its savor, with what will it be salted? Huh? And, and if we have a light, we can't hide it away under a bushel. We need to bring it out. And so this is a, a time for us to, to be a people to celebrate the gospel, the primary reason we exist, 
because it's because we are led by the good news of Jesus and his kingdom proclamation and the kingdom statement. And I've been thinking a lot about that. I was so blessed to read Derek Morpheus, I think, classic book on the, on the kingdom and atonement. If you've never read that, do yourself a reading, a favor, but a not exactly bedtime reading. Anything of Derek is not exactly bedtime reading. But uh, go and read Kingdom and Atonement. But it got me thinking, and so I picked up some more books on the atonement and came to understand that lots of evangelicalism has been robbed of the fullness of the gospel by limiting the atonement to a very narrow perception. I want to, I want to expand that tonight. Just open that, my professor is sitting right here. Quinton, there's your brother. I'd like a crit from you, please. Uh, but, you know, um, I, I recently had a conversation with someone who comes from another faith, comes out of Eastern mysticism, and he said, I believe in Jesus too, but it's not, the, not, the, not your Jesus. I said, well, the only Jesus I know about is in the Bible. He said, well, I haven't read the Bible, but I disagree with it anyway. I said, well, it doesn't really make sense to me. How about, we, how about you read it first, and then we can talk together? So I gave him a fresh Bible. I said, go and read it. It's called NIV, Necessary in Vineyard. So if you want to talk to me, read it. And then let's have a conversation. He said, uh, how many days have I got to read? I said, as long as you like. He, three days later, he came back to see me. And I said, have you read the Bible? He said, I've, I've got up to, I said, just read John's Gospel. That's all I want you to do in these three days, John's Gospel. He, read up to, he said, he read up to chapter 18. I thought, well, that's a real pity. Because that's only part of what the gospel is all about. That's the life of Jesus. So the word becoming flesh, dwelling among us, doing all those amazing things, the teachings, the miracles. And then chapter 19, we have the, the Calvary experience, the cross, so the trial and the, and the death of Christ. And that is so significant. And of course, chapter 20 onwards is the, victus, the Christus Victor, eh? the resurrection. Uh, leading on to the ascension, leading on to the, the Pentecost experience and the, the, the birth of the church. Uh, and, and the church cannot be adequately birthed unless it understands the full breadth of the gospel. And we have the full gospel in front of us. And, and that must include his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so the life has to do with the signs and wonders, the, the example he, led, he left us. Uh, the death has to do with the vicarious, substitutionary death of Christ. And this is not about uh, cosmic child abuse, as some guys want to talk about this. This is a, a God himself putting himself. God was in Christ reconciling the world. It's absolute nonsense and, and dishonoring to speak of this as cosmic child abuse. It's crazy. That's, that's, that's really just what uh, the cynics of the world are calling it. But it's a vicarious Gospel. He died for you and for me. He took our place. And so he, he justifies um, and, he, and, he, and he loves on the wicked, is what Romans says, eh? because of this. And, of course, the victorious side. He rose again. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. So we must understand the gospel includes a, 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 an inspiration to live a, an amazingly different kind of life. Okay? Right through John 1 through 18. And then John 19, he died for you and for me, unworthy while we were yet sinners. Eh? And then, uh, then the, the victory that comes to us. And, and then he's a model for us eh? uh, in, in his life. And uh, he's a ransom for us. He pays a ransom for us. He sets us free. We, we're no longer captive. We, we are a free people uh, in the cross. And then in the, in the resurrection appearances, he, he assures us that he will never forsake us. His presence goes with us. So we're a people who, who've had a model, a ransom, and now we also have <clears throat> a presence that will never leave us and is assured us by the Spirit. Another way of looking at it, <clears throat> the gospel has to do with him, Jesus coming and, and, and courting us, gathering a people. Over 18 chapters of John's gospel, for instance, courting us, uh, developing a, a, a wooing of a bride. Could, could a new people come out that lives like this, that is so different from, from other people? Huh? Uh, and, and so if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. We, we call to newness, and he demonstrates that. And then <clears throat> uh, and there's a penalty paid for us, uh, a bride price, you might say. Huh? And, uh, and then there's a power given us. So we can keep going as, as we explain the gospel in these three dimensions, uh, particularly the atonement coming in its fullness. Uh, he, he spends 18 chapters in John's gospel setting people free from fear, from scarcity, from, from bondages, from addictions. There's a, a freedom declaration. He stands up in Luke's gospel and says, as he proclaims the liberty of the Jubilee, 
when he reads from Isaiah 61, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am the Jubilee on legs. And I'm going to demonstrate. And right up to the age of 33 or plus, however many years it was, thereabouts, he demonstrates a Jubilee lifestyle. Huh? He demonstrates it and invites us to, to have our own guilt taken away by his shed blood on the cross. And then he leads us to live the amazing koinonia life of the early church. Because think about it. That's exactly what happened when the Spirit was poured out. People no longer considered what they had as belonging to themselves. They had all things in common. It was a new day. A jubilee people had been birthed. And, and we, that's the gospel for us. So he comes to be with us. Then he came for us in the cross. And then he comes in us in the Christus Victor. I want you to see the fullness of this gospel we have. Eh? It's such a powerful thing. It's not just, uh, just about the cross. The cross was prepared for, then exercised, and then resulted. Because you, you can't have a resurrection without the death. So it all flows together. He demonstrates that he's, he's without sin. And, and, and the early church began to live the benefits of all this as they became a gospel-led people. Uh, in Acts 3, after the Pentecost outpouring in Acts 2, Acts 3, um, they're going and doing what Brian Blunt is still doing. Uh, 2,000 years later, huh? and healing on the streets. A man is sitting at the gate, beautiful, remember? Uh, and he asked for arms, and they gave him legs. You know what I'm saying? Uh, anyway, and, and they blessed him, a silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto you. And, and there was this just healing out there, a flow to the blessing of others, because that's what the gospel leads us to. Chapter 4, they own their, their fears as they come against the Sanhedrin. And, uh, and they go back to God and say, God, give us again that, that same reminder that the Holy Spirit has given to us. And they have another outpouring and another release of koinonia, of sharing. What an amazing chapter. Um, fresh encounters. Then chapter 5, the challenge for truth in Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that story? Ananias and Sapphira, which is always a, a good one to have before the offering, by the way. Uh, you know, you, if you say I'm going to give so much and you, and you pretend to give it and you don't give it God's not pleased eh? it's that generous spirit of saying Lord I know I can never outgive you what a wonderful way to live and, uh, <clears throat> and so we in chapter 6 of, of Acts just show you the first few chapters how the, the early church was gospel led they realized that they needed to stay focused on the thing that they were saved for and empowered for and so they raise up just very practically, and this is a good view of structure. Structure doesn't to be um, uh, you know, a divine blueprint. It's a practical application in, a, in the best, things, best arrangement to help us serve the gospel to people. So they raise up deacons. Uh, and, and they brought deacons to, to the fore. And of course those deacons became preachers anyway. And Stephen was the first martyr. And, and that happened in chapter 7. And he was the first one who was stoned. And we don't mean like a student got stoned. You know what I'm saying? He got, he got killed uh, because of his... His, his outspoken gospel declaration. So what we're we saying here, we're saying we are gospel-led people. We've gathered for a good purpose. And we, need to, uh, we need to take stock if there is death in the pot. And I've been praying around that. Lord, what does it mean for us to be blowing the whistle? Uh, what are the toxic, poisonous things that would retard us from being expansive? I want to give you a a pile of stuff that I think we need to ask ourselves. Are these things going to be helpful to us? Are they going to be hindrances? Will they will they keep us back? Uh, and just some obvious things like we've moved long moved long ago into a, uh, an experience of church where we all get to play. And part of the outworking of that is we don't use titles because we are brothers and sisters. We all get to play, and we elevate our function rather than our position. So, uh, African Floppy is also here tonight. He's going to preach. Uh, tomorrow and uh, he's got that great book about position passion for position and that's just not what what we're on about eh? and he's he's so he sees that so well thank you for that uh, to teach us about this so we, we really need to stop using titles that the world uses the church world uses and we are just brothers and sisters ordinary men and women empowered by the spirit of god and and so we don't call each other pastor or uh, prophet or evangelist or p- apostle or supersonic apostle or any other Qualifying adjective. Uh, we, we want to get away from titles. 
uh, <coughs> we, we also we want to get away from anything that would keep us unteachable. So I'm very grateful for the fact that we've got Quinton and, and Heather and others that are helping us with the uh, School of, of let me guess, School of Leadership and Theology, SALT. Eh? Um, you need to speak to these guys this week while you're here. There, it's a great ministry we've got going, and it's encouraging us to remain teachable. And we ask anyone who's coming to leadership in the vineyard to make sure you access the input that you can get through this. Eh? It is such a good tool uh, of training. Keep us, keep us humble. Keep us teachable. Keep us learning. Uh, I think another toxic thing that would keep us back is if we, if we, um, if we downplay a core element. And Wimber was very, very committed to. Uh, namely our, our commitment to the poor, to mercy ministry, to social justice issues. And Robin couldn't be with us to, uh, this week, but uh, she, we had a chat the other day, and, and she's so glad that we, we see this and we value it. And uh, when we downplay the poor, we miss God's heart. Eh? The Bible says he, he, gives, he, he gives the poor, lends to the Lord, and he repays richly. We, we simply would have death in our pot if we downplay mercy ministries uh, or social justice issues. So thank you, Robin, for keeping that, beating that drum for us. We appreciate you so much. Um, I think another toxic element that, that needs, we need to blow whistles on, we cannot be leading if we have no vision. And as I travel around this nation and around the continent, uh, I see it as a common factor where there is no vision. People do perish. Churches don't grow. And you can't just sit on your laurels of somebody else's vision in a past generation. Where's your sense of vision? Leadership needs vision. And the power of vision comes through in, 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 in influence. People are not going to be influenced to growth unless there's a, a vision for, for a newness. Uh, we simply cannot be maintainers of, of, what, of the status quo. Uh, somebody once described the Latin word status quo as meaning the mess we're in. I'm not sure if that's true, but... It's just accepting what is and saying that's the way it's always going to be. But God wants so much more for us. He says, Vold, I make all things new. That's what he says. And that's leading us on. That's at the end of Revelation. He's still doing it. At the end of the book, he's still saying, I'm making all things new. Come on, we've got to have vision and leadership. We cannot. If you're not visionary, ask God to someone else to lead your church. Send somebody in. You can't lead without vision. It's not going to work. Not going to work. I'm not talking about numbers necessarily, but I'm talking about an energy that comes in vision, huh? Where there is no vision, people perish. So we need to deal with uh, low visionary uh, energy, low, low visionary energy. Then there's a whole string of things, all the isms. Eh? Watch out for the toxic isms that, that we've done battle with and might still do battle with. Uh, uh, the, the gender issues. The vineyard has come out unashamedly. And Terran, I think you're yet on a weary, Terran. Here we go, my brother. Welcome, eh? Good to have you in the house. Terran wrote a great book, eh? It's a third of, of the three books that helped me tremendously besides the Bible uh, uh, in understanding this issue. Uh, Derek Morphy's book, uh, Different But Equal, huh? Uh, Katya Adams is a great book on equal. And then Terran's book, How God Sees Women, The End of Patriarchy. I don't know if you've got any. Are you on the table here, Terran? You got some here? Great. That's your pension plan, I think, eh? Huh? Here we go. Make sure you. Uh, Make sure you go and pick up these books. But uh, we, we believe that leadership is a gift and a calling. It's got nothing to do with gender. However God packages it, we want to release it and receive it. And it's actually to hold on to patriarchy. It's to hold on to what is a consequence of the fall and to make that normative. And God did not intend that because he gave the, the, the command and the and mandate to lead to Adam and Eve in a mutuality of relationship before the fall. And then patriarchy came in as, as God gave commentary on what was now going to happen. He didn't, tell it to get, he didn't tell them to become patriarchal. He said, you'll see it's going to happen because of the sword between the sexes, if I can use uh, living waters language. The sword between the sexes will be sure now to bring about this patriarchy. And that's exactly so. Patriarchy came as a result of the fall. It wasn't God's intention from the get-go. Um, so just to put that out, the gender issues, and uh, it's just one of the isms, eh? uh, ageism. Since when must you, must you be of a certain age before you can serve in the kingdom of God? Eh? Paul says to Timothy, let no man despise your youth. Eh? And this is a time, Matt, where are you, brother? Matt, yeah, stand up for us, man. Matt's championing, what do you call that? Next gen. Got it, next gen. He's championing next gen, the calling out of a Joshua generation, a younger generation that is ready to step up and step forward and lead 
ongoingly. And we don't need to wait to, to uh, uh, be of a certain age and stage. We just need to be sure that we're teachable, we, we're growing in, in, in the, the, the different C's, as we say, content, character, and charisma, to make sure that we have the capacities to, to, to lead. But uh, I want to just support Matt and, and those that are dealing with calling out a youth group, calling out young people, calling out people of, of tender age to give leadership. And when we res- resent people or resist them because they're too young, I think we're missing a chance, eh? We're missing a chance. We've got a seven-year-old boy in our church. He's probably got more faith than many of our other intercessors. He's the quickest one to come and pray, and he himself is doing battle with, 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 uh, with cancer. This little boy is an inspiration to us. Let me tell you a quick thing about him. It's, it's digress. He, he had, went to a cardiologist the other day for a checkup. And uh, uh, when he came around from it all, and he also called it because he knew that they put a camera inside to check inside of his heart. So he says to the cardiologist, he says, uh, Doctor, um, what does his house look like? <laughs> and the cardiologist said, what, what do you mean? What is his house? Whose house? No, Jesus' house. What do you mean? No, he lives there in my heart. You saw the inside. What does it look like? Uh, I mean, and he was, in all sincerity, he wasn't being funny, eh? This is so inspirational. Eh? Thank you, Duncan. Yeah. Uh, some people have, in low vision also have a, just a survivalism about their lives, and, and that's a toxic thing. God wants to set us free from that. It's just surviving, just surviving, keeping it going. We've got to, we've got to be growing, guys. I think there's another thing that is a toxic element for us, and this uh, can be relevant for us across the movement where many of us, because of the backdrop of, of John Wimber and the Righteous Brothers and many of our own stories came out of the hippie, hippie movement that became Jesus people. So, any, hippies, any ex-hippies still in the house? There we go. <laughs> With those long hair and beads and bell bottoms, you know, we used to put wedges in them and make them wider, the more wider the hippie, hippie are. Anyway, um, one of the things about the hippie movement is a reluctance for commitment. A reluctance for commitment. And that's a, that's a, a death in the pot issue. When we don't want to make a commitment to something. And uh, Costa always says, and he warned me, he said, leading the movement is going to be like herding cats. Are you ready for that? <laughs> uh, and I think that we can do better if we simply lead by inspiration, not obligation. And that's what we're seeking to do, just so as you understand that. I think he, God wants us to shake off the hippie casualness and become much more intentional. Uh, like this uh, one um, hippie girl says to her, her boyfriend, uh, hey, it's a long time since you told me you love me. Do you still love me? She says, of course I love you. I love everybody. <laughs> it's not exactly what she wanted to hear. Huh? So, <laughs> yeah. Like the other wife said to her husband, you haven't told me you love me for a long, long time. She, he said to her, look, I told you that 40 years ago on our, on our wedding. If it ever changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, how, about, how about another toxic thing where we lean to entitlement rather than empowerment? We create an entitlement spirit that, is, that retards people's full expression because they may not have the competence to do what they feel entitled to have position for. And so as a consequence of that, as we've seen it happening in our own structures in South Africa, uh, all kinds of waste happens. Wasted opportunities, corruption takes place so much, and entitlement is, is, a, is a toxic thing for us. Um, I think uh, where we failed also is where we've been neglectful of those, uh, uh, the core vineyard values of flavor, fellowship, and finance. If we drop any of those, we'll find ourselves de- degenerating into a very wishy-washy uh, and not... Uh, inspired movement, not moving forward, not gospel inspired. Um, I think another one would just be, uh, and, and this is difficult for some to, to hear, but uh, an overplay on accountability to bring about changed lives. In the vineyard, we've seen the value of encounter being more powerful than, than accountability for bringing about a change in our life. If people's lives only change because they've got a accountability group around them, coercing them, asking them the hard questions, forcing them in a direction. I know there's help in that, but it can have the effect of making out like the gospel changes are from the outside in. But actually, when you meet the Lord, when you've encountered His grace, His, His love, His grace teaches you to say no to ungodliness. We've had people join our church who've been asked to leave us some other churches because they didn't comply with accountability structures. 
and they've come here, and they're so grateful that here all we do is we invite them primarily into encounter with Jesus and allow the work of His Spirit to to take deep root and it changes from the inside out. Then then your pastors can be pastors and not policemen, hey? Uh, I think another thing is that, that it could be death in the pot if we downplay the need for ongoing renewal. We need to keep gathering to stir each other up to love and good works. We need ongoing renewal. We, and by that, I also mean not only in ourselves, but around us. And we want to bring renewal to churches around us. If you're in a town, village, city, wherever you are, and you're not also concerned about other churches who eat, to eat the benefits of what's on your table, and, you want to, and you, you're not concerned about them, that's a problem. That's death in the pot. We can't do well to the neglect of others. If we're doing well in God, others should benefit too. The churches in your neighborhood, in your, in your suburb, in your village should all benefit because of, of renewal that we carry. You remember the, the vineyard man, eh? The church planting arm, and the other is the renewal factor. Let's keep that going. I think there are also some elements of toxic uh, view when it comes to um, money, money matters. We've, we've got some strange views on money. And maybe some of it has been skewed because of the abuse that has happened in certain movements concerning money um, and the defining of salvation in monetary terms. God wants something different for us. Um, we, we, we're learning from a biblical point of view, if Jesus is Lord, then money must become our servant and not our master. And we tell it where to go. And so we exercise a generosity, a stewardship, and we stay out of debt, eh? I hope that makes sense. But even in our churches, we let vision call us forward, and vision inspires resources and attracts resources. So we're able to do much more than we would if we just sat down until we could afford it. And when God told Noah to build an ark, he didn't know that it was going to take him 100 years and didn't know what rain was, didn't know what an ark was, but he just stepped out and God showed him, and the whole thing came together. I think another quick toxic element that we need to watch out for is if we allow any space for disunity to grow, That'll be toxic. Deal with it, hey? Own up. If you want to help in having a crucial conversation, get all the pubs. He can help you with that. Or, or Karen from this church here at Eden Life Center. They'll help you improve your EQ and fix your disunity, hey? Uh, I think that whole thing about the woke and cancel cultures is toxic, guys. I don't think it's helpful to us in the slightest. It's, uh, it's not rooted in, in, in solid thinking. It's, it's rooted in, what's, in popularism, hey? in what's popular rather than what is true. I want to put out a warning about that, uh, the conformity to, to uh, what is acceptable, politically correct or culturally acceptable. We live by another culture called the kingdom of God. And let that and let the, the, the authority of God's word guide us in these things. This is so important. Uh, what's that? Watch out for Gnostic leadership. We've seen that hurt the movement. We saw it in Anaheim. We've seen it in our, own, in our own city, in our own country, on at least two specific occasions where people had a Gnostic word from God to, to leave the vineyard, but they never tested with anybody else, never processed anything. And for me, that's a recipe for both immaturity and, uh, and waywardness when it comes to uh, not displaying the, the gospel impact on our lives for the kingdom. This is very important. and uh, God wants to save us from dealing with uh, the kind of Gnostic leadership ideas where you just hear from God, but it's no, never tested at all. Um, and wherever we have uh, anything uh, that is acquiescent to what is, rather than reaching for what can be, Paul says in Philippians 3, I haven't achieved, but there's one thing I do. I want to press on to lay hold of all of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me, all of it. He, he kept leaning forward, hey? And Hebrews seven twenty five says that uh, he can, because he prays for us, he intercedes for us, he can save us completely. That's uh, in quantity and in duration. Huh? He can save us completely. So let's not settle for what is when we can have so much more. Moody said that a little faith will get, you, get your soul to heaven, but a lot of faith will get heaven to your soul. Huh? And we need to increase the level of our faith so we can have more of heaven on earth. Huh? That's what we're looking for. Uh, so that's what happened here. They're having this, this poiki, and they cry out more, more than one sort. They, they, they all began to say, there's death in the pot. And, and then Elisha says, get some flour. Let's just open that just for a few moments. Flour, amongst other things, is, is um, crushed, crushed wheat. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an unusual thing, to, let's just say that. Because previously when there was a, a problem, you got salt in a new bowl. 
Now it's another deal. So he's, he's pioneering. He's listening for the, the, the now action that God wants to, to have happen. And um, I think God's calling out a new pioneering spirit in us. What's the thing he's asking you to do in your city, in your fellowship? Eh? He's asking for a pioneering spirit in us all over again. We won't settle for what was, but reach for what can be. Um, and then it's, it's crushed. There's a brokenness in it, and I love this. That we've, we say in the vineyard, uh, as Wimber taught us also, never trust a leader who doesn't limp. Something about our brokenness, uh, the things we suffered, the things we struggled with, they actually make us. It's far safer to have a broken person come onto your leadership team than a successful person. Success is dangerous. Pride comes before a fall, but we know that grace is accessed in the valleys of life, eh? May God help us to, to embrace brokenness as part of our, our normal for how we, we lead. And then, of course, uh, it's, it's crushed and put together. Yeah. How many remember Joan Carlos Ortiz from South America? Do you remember Joan Carlos? <laughs> I see some of the, I almost called you geriatrics, but you know what I mean, the old people. Uh, uh, almost. And uh, he, he used to talk about uh, mashed potato love. Huh? You remember mashed potato love? Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Where you take a potato, you boil them, and then you take the jackets off and you put them and you crunch them together. You don't know what part of that belong to which potato anymore. It's all together. And that's what it is for us in, in the church and in the movement in the vineyard. Eh? God wants us to have that kind of unity that is deeply there for each other. Deeply there for each other. All the way. I, I had a lady leave our church over a statement I made many, many years ago when I quoted Robert Murray McChain, uh, 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 a missionary who uh, died at the age of 29, a Scottish missionary. 29 he died. He only served for uh, six years or something like that. But uh, what a wonderful ministry. But the one statement from his life that impacted me, he said, I have discovered my people's greatest need is my personal whole holiness. What he meant by that was his wholeness, his pursuit of being whole, because it meant that if he allowed the gospel to work in him, he'd be less toxic for his people, because people become like the leaders are. So choose leaders that are walking what you want your people to walk in, in any area of life. If you do that, you've got a greater chance of them being inspired in a, in a healthy direction. And uh, this lady didn't like it, and she left the church, which like was just arrogant. But it's the truth. I still, be, I still believe it, that leadership needs to be honest about its processing. Your anxieties, your depressions, your angers, your, your history, your abuses, deal with the stuff. Find someone to help you, but deal with it. Don't live with it, because it, you're a distorted person, and you'll be, you'll be poisoning death in the pot for the church, unless you grow up and deal with it. And by the way, grow up before you grow older. Hey, Ellen? Agree? Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a friend. Uh, I had a friend. <laughs> Paul Verain. Some of you might remember Paul Verain, the Methodist bishop up in Johannesburg. Paul and I were varsity together, and, and he used to, on his, on his day off when he was here in St. John's Methodist, he used to say he, he, his favorite thing to do on a Monday is to, to go and ride the super tubes on the beachfront. And he, found, he said, Dave, I found the, the best way to ride the super tube. Uh, and they, he was so good at it. They gave him a season ticket to come anytime he wanted to. He'd ride the super tube every Monday up and down. All over. And he said, I found the way, to, the way to get the best ride out of the super tube was the way of least resistance. Just go with the flow. Go with the flow. Don't resist it. If you try and resist, you're going to mess up your, your experience. Go with the flow. And I think that, that correlates with Andrew Murray's revival in 1860 in, 1860s in Worcester. When he, and he wrote all books about that. Remember Surrender, Total Surrender, all these, those books about consecration. We've seen it happening in Asbury now. Huh? There's nothing better than a consecrated life to, get, to, to, to attract the full blessing of God's grace in your life. Huh? I believe that he wants us to, to experience the, f the freshness of that. I'm landing on this just to say, I recently took a fresh look at the life of Joan of Arc. You know Joan of Arc? French girl, teenager who heard from God, uh, but the people couldn't believe it until those who did believe it benefited from what she heard, and she led f uh, France into significant history, uh, histories of, of battles in four 1431 thereabouts, when she, she, was finally, um, she was finally taken in a particular battle, and she was um, condemned to death by the church leadership of the day, because she heard from God. They said that's mental illness or it's witchcraft. One of the two. We can't have a person like that floating loose 
and they, they, they killed her, burnt her at the stake. Uh, and she, she, uh, she died praising God, honoring him. They, they had to do more than fire because it, it eventually stabbed her and cut her because it, it, she wouldn't die from it. It was just another resilient thing. Twenty years later, the church was called to account for its stupidity. May God help us, eh? That we don't judge those that are hearing from God, but we test it out. And I think we're in a day now where God is calling for courageous people. And this is what she said amongst her the most famous statements, and particularly towards the end of her life. I'm not afraid, she said. I was born to do this. Eh? Let's stand together.